Mr. Kane, back in 2008, you wrote that the Wall Street bailout was a win-win for the taxpayer. You just heard Governor Romney. Do you agree? Conceptually, I made that statement based upon the concept, but I happen to agree with uh, uh, Governor Romney. The way it was administered is where it got off track. They were discretionary in which institutions they were going to save rather than apply it equitably, which is what most of us thought was going to be done. The implementation of it is where they got off track. I didn't agree with it. I don't think Governor Romney ag agreed with it. So did a lot of us. The implementation was at fault. Uh, housing is considered one of the real problems in terms of our economy and getting housing starts up. Can I say one thing before we go to housing? Yes. Because I think this is really important. <clears throat> There's a real possibility that you can't have the euro and the Greek economy in the same system. There's a possibility we could have a meltdown in the next year. The thing that is most obvious looking back is that Paulson and, and, and Bernanke and Geithner didn't have a clue. Not because they're not smart, but because they were operating in a world that had suddenly changed so radically they didn't know. Right. One of the reasons I've said that the Congress should insist that every decision document from 2008, 2009, and 2010 at the Fed be released, as we are not any better prepared today for a crisis of that scale because the people who were in that crisis and were wrong are still in charge. And I think we need to learn what did they do right and what right. did they do learn wrong precisely for the reason you raised about 2013. Let me go to housing. Um, what would you do? Uh, would you get the federal government out of housing? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's no need to look at no uh, Freddie, the, no Freddie Mac, no Fannie Mae, nothing. The, uh, the, the no, you, you, that's where the distortions come. That's where the moral hazard comes from. That's where the malinvestment, the, the overbuild. It was predictable. You talked about what economists uh, we should look to, and unfortunately, we've been living with Keynesian economics uh, for many, many decades. And everybody who was right about predicting the bubbles were Austrian economists. They said they were coming. And yet, they're also saying, and I agree with them, that everything that we're doing right now is wrong. So what we did with the housing bubble, yes, we had too many houses. It was glaring in our face. The, the bubble was doomed to burst, and it came because of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Easy Credit, and also Community Reinvestment Act. So uh, who, who got into trouble? The people who did the speculating, the Wall Street, the derivatives market? They got the bailout. They got privileges. So what happened to the middle class? They lost their jobs. They lost their houses. This whole system is all messed up. And you're, what I hear here is just tinkering with the current system and not looking at something new and different. And it's a free market economy without a Federal Reserve system, with sound money. If you don't have that, you're going to continue with the bubble. And this propping up of this debt and keeping the correction, you need the correction. You need right. to get rid of the malin investment in the debt. The debt Time. is the burden on the economy. All right, we'll be back. Take a break and be right back. Stay with us from Dartmouth, Governor of Texas. Hanover, New Hampshire. Do you agree with the former president? Well, I think we're certainly talking about different times because what I heard him say there that he was willing to uh, trade uh, tax increases for uh, reductions. Um, and um, I don't think he ever saw those uh, reductions. He just saw the tax increase. Matter of fact, in his diary, uh, he made that statement that uh, uh, he's still looking around for those uh, uh, those reductions. Uh, so, I mean, from the standpoint, of, that's one of the problems that we got in Washington D.C. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, I think Americans are so untrustworthy of what's going on in Washington is because they never see uh, a cut in spending. Uh, they always hear the. Uh, the siren song of, you know, if you'll allow us to, to raise taxes, then we'll make these reductions over here, uh, when the fact of the matter is, the, the issue is, we need to have a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. And the next President of the United States needs to spend his time yeah. passing a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. But I want to stay with this idea of spending cuts uh, and revenue increases and, and go back to you, Governor Romney. Uh, this is where it is, it seems, in Washington right now. Not only the paralysis, but also you've got uh, the super committees. And if, in fact, they can't find an agreement, we're going to have a trigger with automatic cuts, including defense. So doesn't that demand some kind of compromise, as Reagan suggested? Well, I, I don't know which uh, particular compromises he was referring to. We could take a look at that. But I can tell you this. If you go back a few years before that clip and go to JFK's time, 
that government at all levels, federal, state, and local, was consuming about 27% of the U.S. economy. Today it consumes about 37% of the U.S. economy. It's on track to get to 40%. We cease at some point to be a free economy. And the idea of saying, we just want a little more. Just give us some more tax revenue. We need that. That is not the answer for America. The answer is to cut federal spending. The answer is to cap how much the federal government can spend as a percentage of our economy and have a balanced budget amendment. And the second part of the answer is to get our economy to grow. Because the idea of just cutting and cutting and taxing more, I understand mathematically those things work, but nothing works as well as getting the economy going. But can we get Americans back to work, get them paying taxes, get, get corporations growing in America, investing in America, bring dollars back, as Rick said, repatriation dollars, bring a trillion three back from overseas, invest in the United States, get this economy going, and I'll tell you, these kinds of problems will disappear. But could we get back to the actual choice that is likely to confront Congress at the end of the year, which is some mix of revenues and cuts or these draconian automatic spending cuts that would include defense. Which of those two, if that is the choice, would you prefer? Well, my, my choice is not to cut defense. I think it's a terrible idea to cut defense. I think it's a terrible idea to raise taxes, particularly at a time when the economy is uh, struggling. The idea of raising taxes, taking more money away from the American people so government can spend it and, and can spend it. R right now, the president has a jobs bill. So this How does last jobs bill work out for us? But this is not, the automatic so well. cuts? The, 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 no, I do not purple? want the automatic cuts. I want to see that super committee take responsibility for getting the economy going again by reining in the scale of the federal government and saying we're going to pull back okay. on some of the programs we have Right. and reform our entitlements so they're sustainable. Right. The American people want to see growth and jobs, and they believe that the right way to do it is by cutting back on the scale of government, and they're right. And without any increase in revenue. I just want to say, I want to say, one, I want to say one thing about the entire way Washington works, which was just posed in that question. First of all, the Congress couldn't figure out how to get the debt ceiling done with a president who showed zero leadership. So they adopt a truly stupid bill. Okay, and the bill basically says we're either going to shoot ourselves in the head or cut off our right leg and we'll come in and, and around Thanksgiving and we'll show you how we're going to cut off the right leg and the alternative will be shooting ourselves in the head. Let me just say bluntly, all of the spending cuts that are built into the debt ceiling bill, all of them are acts of Congress. They can all be repealed at any moment. It is nonsense to say we're going to disarm the United States unilaterally because we're too stupid to balance the budget any other way. All right. Congressman Bachman. Last summer, I was a leading voice in the wilderness of Washington and a lone voice, as a matter of fact, saying, do not increase the debt ceiling. By that, what I was saying is, let's not give Barack Obama another $2.4 trillion blank check to spend. Think of what this means. Our government right now, this is significant. We are spending 40% more than what we take in. We all paid a lot of taxes this year. We paid $2.2 trillion in taxes. That's a lot of money from all the American people. The, the American government spent 100% of that $2.2 trillion, but the travesty is they spent $1.5 trillion more than that. That's the problem. Every year we are spending about 40% more than what we take in. Our answer has to be that we cut back on the spending so we get to balance. We can't do this well, because all, back on the spending all around us are young people that are going to be paying for this burden. And their tax rates won't be our tax rates. Their tax rates could come at some point. Their overall effective burden, I'm a federal tax lawyer. That's what I do for a living. And my, my background is in eco economics. Their tax rates someday in their peak earning years, Charlie, could be as much as 75%. Who's going to get out of bed in the morning to go to work if they're paying 75% tax rates? We've got to get our spending house in order and cut back on spending. Cutting back on spending, in your judgment, will do it. That's one piece of the answer. That's not the whole answer, yeah. but we well, have to take, cut I want you to take a look. We'll come to all of you. But let me take a look at another clip. Uh, this one you will recognize as well. Here it is. It's called the 999 plan. It imposes a 9% business tax, flat tax a 9% personal flat tax and a 9% non-personal 
national sales tax. That I Julianne. said we would get back. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kane, you say that your plan is, is revenue neutral, and last year the U.S. collected $2.2 trillion in tax revenue, but Bloomberg government has run the numbers, and your plan would have raised no more than $2 trillion. And even with that shortfall, you'd still be slapping a 9% sales tax on food and medicine. The problem with that analysis is that it is incorrect. <laughs> is because they start with assumptions that we don't make. Remember, 999 plan throws out the current tax code, and it starts with three simple economic driving principles. Production drives the economy, risk-taking drives growth, and we need sound money, measurements must be dependable. Now, what 999 does, it expands the base. When you expand the base, we can arrive at the lowest possible rate, which is 999. The difference between the 999 plan and the other plans that are being proposed is that they pivot off of the existing tax code. We've had an outside firm, independent firm, All right. dynamically score it, and so our numbers will make it revenue neutral. All right, But then Karen, explain go ahead, why, I'm sorry, go ahead. under your plan, all Americans should be paying more for milk, for a loaf of be bread, and beer. Big, and pizza. I don't buy beer. <laughs> you have to start with the biggest tax that a lot of Americans pay, which is the payroll tax, 15.3%. That goes to 9%. That's a six percentage point difference, and the price prices will not go up. So they've got a six percentage point difference to apply to the national sales tax piece of that. And in doing so, they have the flexibility to decide on how much they want to spend it on new goods, how much they want to spend it on used right. goods, because there's no tax on used goods. But Congresswoman Bachman, you're a former IRS lawyer. Do you agree? Uh, I would have to say that the, the 999 plan isn't a jobs plan, it is a tax plan. And I would say that from my experience being in Congress, but also as a federal tax lawyer, when you, the last thing you would do is give Congress another pipeline of a revenue stream, and this gives Congress a pipeline in a sales tax. A sales tax can also lead to a value-added tax. The United States Congress put into place the Spanish-American War Tax in 1898. We only partially repealed that in 2006. So once you get a new revenue stream, you're never going to get rid of it. And one thing I would say is when you take the 999 plan and you turn it upside down, I think the devil's in the details. <laughs> All right. I, I have to... I, I, you got to let me respond. We've given you several chances to respond. I'll come back. We'll continue to talk about taxes and spending. Uh, we also know here that there has been a paradigm shift uh, in the world economic order. We know about China and we know about India. Here is our next clip and we will respond from that. Here it is. And I will label China as it is a currency manipulator, and I will go after them for stealing our intellectual property, and they will recognize that if they cheat, there is a price to pay. I certainly don't want to trade war with anybody.